There's a neighborhood in my hometown called French Hill. It takes up this area. It's not a hill, it's really a plateau. Three long streets, about a mile and a half, run east out of downtown to what was then swampy land at the edge of town. Now it's a mall. And it's crossed by 12 city blocks of numbered streets, 1st Street, 2nd Street, 3rd Street, called French Hill. And I bought my first house on French Hill in 2000. And we still had a couple of neighbors at that time who were of French-Canadian descent. <coughs> As the neighborhood was originally settled by immigrants from French-speaking Canada in the late 19th, early 20th century. But when I lived there, the neighborhood had a lot of Spanish speakers, mostly from Puerto Rico, but also from the Dominican Republic. And then increasingly, through the 90s and the time I lived there, people from Southeast Asia, Vietnam. And so it had gone from being French Hill to Bariquin Hill to Viet Hill. And I volunteered time when I could at the Spanish Center, which was located in the neighborhood. And it never ceased to amaze me, nor does it still to this day, when I'm in my hometown, I will occasionally hear, as you do, somebody speaking out of ignorance or prejudice or fear or hate of those people, meaning the Spanish-speaking folks that live in the area or the Southeast Asians that live in the area. And I still don't understand it because when I was growing up it was the same and it seemed obvious to me as a teenager and still bewilders me to this day how people who came from French-speaking Canada and from Ireland and from Italy and settled in my hometown could look down with such disdain upon those who came from Puerto Rico and Vietnam. The generations change, the names change, the languages change. But the stranger and the newcomer always seems to be feared. As I prepared for this Sunday, I was pre preparing to talk about welcoming the stranger and how it impacts the life of the host and the guest. But the more I pondered about it, it felt to me like I was talking about tolerance. And as you know, I'm not a big fan of tolerance. Tolerance is better than outright hostility and violence, but it's not an exception and an inclusion and a respect and a dignity. And I started to think that maybe thinking about things like this in terms of guests and hosts does the same thing. We don't want to have a guest and a host. We want everybody to be actually and for real at home. When you are a truly loving and welcoming host, you don't treat people as guests, you treat them as family as people who have always belonged, and do belong, and will belong. I began to think that hospitality and its concept, when you practice it, and it's not that all-inclusive, everyone is home and family here, implies that someone owns a space or a place, and others are tolerated. If you jump my fence, cross my field, walk across my lawn, break into my house, pick my fruit from the garden, take my vegetables without permission, you are trespassing. But if I give you permission to do these things, you're my guest. And radical welcoming is letting everyone be at home, not be a guest. We welcome new members today, and part of our practice of radical hospitality is there is no credo or dogmatic test. If you have found this place and want to share in our work, you are home, you found it, we're here, we're yours, you're ours. And I wonder what stops us in our larger society from getting there, holding on so tenaciously to my yard, my garden, my house, my food. It's such a human thing, and it bewilders me still. Pondering the sermon this week, I began to think of this scene in the movie Cry Freedom, which is the story of 
Apartheid activist Stephen Biko, played wonderfully by Denzel Washington. Highly recommended if you haven't seen it. And it's the height of apartheid in South Africa, and Biko is a banned person. He's not allowed to meet with more than one person at a time. He can't publish writing. He needs to stay in house arrest. And a white newspaper editor from the city, Donald Woods, takes up his cause and starts to struggle against apartheid from the white liberal perspective. And the first time Woods meets Biko is in an underground cafe, bar, and restaurant. And Biko talks to him about white liberals. In Woods, the newspaper editor, trying to do the right thing, says, but we're working towards inclusion gradually. And Biko tells him, yeah, you want to get a slightly better education, slightly better housing, so you can get slightly better jobs and be slightly more like you. We don't want that. He said, you invite us to sit at your table with your linen and your china and your silver tableware, and we are to dress like you and eat like you and use your fancy things like you, and you will kindly let us stay. But we don't want that. We want to wipe the table clean. It's an African table, and we will sit at it in our own right. Before you whites arrived, we had our own culture and our own civilization. Our language was different and is from yours. My niece does not call my wife aunt, but mother's sister. That's the word in our language. It's literally mother's sister and brother's son. There are no separate words for family. All begin with brother and sister. And we are all family. Biko is right. There are millions of displaced people in our world. And they are coming to us in our community. And we have the choice to be radically welcoming that this is their home. They're not guests. Brothers and sisters, even people we have not met yet. It is an amazing experience and transformative when you are treated with such hospitality. And it transforms you when you offer it such. It is true. But that transformative hospitality is not the one that treats someone as a guest. It's the one that treats them as family. The time I most powerfully experienced this was I was teaching high school in the days right in the wake of 9-11, right after the bombings. And my first year religion curriculum with the students I was teaching was world religions. And the bombings had just happened. And there in my school, among my students, among my colleagues teaching, all the stuff was flying around that you probably heard at the time. The condemnation, the prejudice, the fear, the hate of all of Islam because of these bombings. So the thing I knew I needed to do is I knew I needed to take my kids to the mosque. In a couple weeks after 9-11, we took them on the tee and we took them over to Cambridge and took them to the mosque of the Islamic Society of Boston. It was Ramadan. If you know about Ramadan, Muslims fast from food and water from sunrise to sunset. They gave us a tour of the mosque. They gave each student a Quran in Arabic and a Hebrew English Quran. They gave everybody a little pamphlet about Islam. And they brought us in to eat lunch. There was a spread I have never seen the like of before. A teenager's dream. There was pizza they had sent out to McDonald's for hamburgers and french fries. There were cakes and candy and cookie and potato chips and everything you would want to eat at that time if you were 15 years old, right? And my students were amazed and they just dove in and began pigging out. <laughs> I couldn't eat a bite of anything. It was Ramadan. None of these people were eating. The students didn't know. They didn't get it. I had told them ahead of time, but they were oblivious while we were there. 
And the woman who was our host came to me with a bowl of salad and a slice of pizza. I couldn't take it from her. My, my eyes were welling up with tears. And she puts a hand on my wrist and says, please, have lunch. You are our guest. You are in our home. You belong here. During Ramadan, this woman hasn't had anything to eat or drink since sunrise and won't again until sunset. And she has just put on a lavish feast for me and my students, none of whom, the hosts, were touching a piece of it because they were fasting. I have rarely been so made radically at home in my life. When I see the harsh rhetoric that is aimed at immigrants and refugees, especially now from people running for president of the United States. I think of that lunch. How? How do you not treat somebody the way those people treated me? What lack of decency and humanity must it require not to fling open your doors and make people at home? How much can we share? How much can we offer? How much can we include? This is our task. And the need is tremendous and overwhelming. We have heard how many millions need help and assistance. And I'm not sure how we do it all, because the numbers are staggering. But I do know that even the poorest of us live in perverse and extreme luxury compared to the plight of those refugees and reality to most people in the world. And so it is our job somehow to encourage our community as well as ourselves to be so radically welcoming that we are offering not a guest experience, but a home experience. <coughs> Will we allow ourselves to be transformed by the stranger among us? Will we allow ourselves to rethink our preconceptions, our ideas of safety, our ideas of wealth and stability and security? I think only when we put ourselves in the place of having that need ourselves can we sympathize and empathize enough to let ourselves be transformed. The first time I got a real powerful sense of what being the stranger was like, I was in college. I had started an Amnesty International student chapter at Pittsburgh State College. And one of the students on campus was a woman named Kabogo Makeni, and she was from Pinville, Soweto, South Africa. And if you know anything about the history of South Africa, Pinville, Soweto was a site of a paramilitary raid that killed hundreds of students. But there she was. And she invited me to a meeting of the International Student Union. And I went. And she wasn't the only person I knew there, but it was close. I mean, I recognized people, but I'd never spoken to anybody else. Mohammed from Pakistan, Francisco from El Salvador, and others. But everyone was black and brown and Asian. And although they were super kind, after a few minutes, I started to feel very uncomfortable and I didn't understand why. <coughs> and then Francisco says to me, how does it feel to be the only person in the room who's different? Indeed. Everyone around me human, but nobody like me. And he smiled, he had this great huge smile, Francisco did, and he looked at me and he said, imagine what it's like being that person all the time. How can we? We are never that person. That's the only time in my life I was only ever that person. I was the only white face in the classroom most of the time I was teaching, but all the rest of the faculty were white. 
Imagine being ripped away from home and family and friends and plopped in a strange place where you're always the person who's different. And all of a sudden, the work of the Sentry of Carolites pops as something incredibly sacred and important. And even our donation is a huge part of helping. But maybe we can get involved in a little bit of what else they do. And Diane will be at coffee hour to talk to anybody who would like to learn a little more. Robert Frost wrote in his poem, The Death of the Hired Man, that home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And that's a well-remembered and oft-quoted line from that poem, but virtually no one goes to the next line. I should have thought it was something you shouldn't have had to earn. Home is where we all already belong. It's not if you're okay or meet the criteria or don't make your relatives afraid. That's the most powerful line in the poem. I should have thought it wasn't something you shouldn't have had to earn. When I moved back here in August, as some of you know, I had a little housing difficulty. First apartment I moved into wasn't so great. And I had family of origin around. My brother was here, but his apartment's already too full. There was literally almost no room for me on their floor when I needed somewhere to stay. My mom had just moved into senior housing. And again, literally almost had not enough floor space for me to lay down and sleep on. So I was, in a sense, homeless for a couple of weeks, switching apartments. But then it was where my family of choice, my friends, my extended family, didn't treat me as a guest. They just took me right in. The woman who laid her hands on me Sunday at the installation swelled me right into our house and lived with her for a month. I was not a guest. I was part of the family. I was home. Our job here is to make this not the place where when someone shows up at our doors we have to take them in, but want to take them in. Of course we would take them in. To see people not as our guests but our family. For how can anyone be a guest in our church, our town, our country, when it's already home? Just like it is for us. 